much. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think this is the first of our sort of hybrid meetings that we're holding. So we uh, ask for a little patience and a little grace as we sort of work through this. Virtually, board members, you have Bert Pennick, myself, um, and Donna Jackson. In the room, you have Mr. Papa, Mr. Vaughn, Ms. Wilson, and Mr. Loth. Um, so that sort of constitutes certainly a quorum. Um, so we'll call this meeting to order. Um, AARB meetings are public and are open for public comment. Rules for public comment can be obtained from the Department of General Services. At this time, I'm looking for an approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Is there a motion? I make the motion that the minutes of the last meeting be approved. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Is there a second? Uh, I so I heard a muffled I'll second. Can you raise your hand, whoever that was? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. We're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get through this. We're gonna do this. Um, Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, Angela, is there any other business? Hearing none, then we'll move on to the consent agenda. And starting with item 2.1, DCR Chestnut Bathhouse renovation Bear, at Bear Creek Lake State Park. Any comments from DHR? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. DHR comments are that they have reviewed this project. It is not concerned about that as a non contributing official within the Bear Creek Lake State Park Historic District because of the construction after the period of the pivot, which is 1938 to 1940. The landing construction is still not being adversely impacted by the work as described. So DHR is not concerned about this. Thank you, sir. Um, and I'll say it, your 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 voice trailed off a little bit for me at the end there, um, but I, I have it in recording. Okay, two point two is VCU uh, Resident Center Suite renovation. Is there, is there any comment from DHR? Okay, thank you. 2.3 uh, VCCS exterior dedication signs, the business science. Any comments from DHR? Yes, DHR does not need to and that's required by the Very good. 2.4 VC. Thank you. 2.5 Department of Military Affairs Access Control Point at Camp Pendleton. Thank you. 2.6, Southside Virginia Community College, the replacement of external wayfinding signage. And the AR is not using the Thank you. 2.7 is University of Mary Washington, Albee Hall demolition and site improvements. is an 
identified in this very history at the uh, University of Mary Washington. But uh, so far, it's not been officially listed on either the Virginia Landmark Register or the National Register of Historic Places. It's eligible. We hope someday that Mary Washington will receive the National Register of Historic Places. But we still have. Thank you, sir. And 2.8 VSU Post Office Tower Edition. Uh, right. VHR is not restricted, but the request to you in order to provide technical assistance comment is this project is within the Virginia Landmark Register and National Register of Historic Places. Eligible. Okay. All right, and I apologize, caller. I'm, I'm having a little bit hard time making up, but I'm assuming it's very audible in the room, and so I'll probably just request your your um, type comments after the meeting. Um, and two point nine, Longwood University at Langford Hall ground floor renovations. Okay, thank you. And 2.10 VCU modifications to Sanger Nelson Connector Bridge. Bear with me on this one. Uh, DHR will need to review this as part of the larger children's hospital at Richmond project. Additionally, mitigation and a demo we still need to draft and execute to adverse impact for the children's hospital of Richmond Pavilion of Richmond. August 2020 was the last time DHR and DCU discussed adverse impact development for children's hospital edition and DCU Health System Adult Meditation Training. Both projects will have an adverse impact, and at the time, a demo is was being drafted covering those master plan projects. During the August 2020 meeting, DHR recommended listing the Medical College of Virginia Historic District and or West Hospital individually. West Hospital is pretty hard to identify on the Virginia Landmark Register and National Register of Historic Places. The Division of Historic Resources was further recommended that a listing was not possible and intensive level survey should be done on West Hospital. Additionally, we recommend that preservation measures should be put in place to ensure appropriate future renovations of West Hospital. We would be willing to discuss this internally and let DHR know that the proposed mitigation is feasible. DHR last heard from DCU held. November 2020 email from DHR encouraged DCU to reach out to their leadership <coughs> for, what was, for what the decision on West Hospital is. DHR recommended DCU reach out to us to finish up the required MOU for future related projects. In other words, this is between their DHR and DCU to determine. Um, I guess we can approve this connecting bridge sub 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 subject to ongoing uh, dispute and consultation between uh, DCU and the Department of Justice. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. That makes sense. Yeah, understood. Um, and finally, 2.11 Chesterfield County GRTC bus shelter installations. Uh, DHR is not reviewed and does not need to address the part of that notification. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So um, 
if someone could make the motion for the approval of the consent agenda with comments about which projects are requested for DHR review, I would appreciate it. Oh, and, and I might note that all of these comments are submitted to uh, directly to the others. Ms. Burgess, um, I make the motion to take only item on the consent agenda with the exception of item 2.10. Okay, that was Tom. Is there a second? It's Mr. Vaughn. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Loth. I'm calling. I'm calling. Calling question here. Ms. Wilson. Aye. Mr. Vaughn. Aye. Mr. Papa. Aye. Ms. Jackson. Aye. And the chair is an aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so moving into the regular agenda, and I would again ask um, those in the room to speak into the mic as best you can um, to make sure that everyone on the call can hear clearly. The first item on the regular agenda is 3.1 Virginia Tech English Field Baseball Pitching Lab. Is the applicant on the call or in the room? Um, they are presenting this one virtually, so I'll be promoting them now. Okay. Good morning, Liza. Was there anybody that I needed to promote along with you for the presentation? Uh, yes, Nick Duncan with Collie Architects. Okay, give me just one moment. Okay, Nick should be connected. Um, as a reminder, you all have 15 minutes for your presentation and you can start whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. Well, good morning. Um, I'm Lisa Morris, the Assistant Vice President for Planning and the University Architect at Virginia Tech. And the item we're bringing before you today, the English Field Baseball Pitching Lab, um, is a significantly revised project from one that we brought back, uh, brought before you last year, last November, which was titled the Pitching Lab and Weight Room Edition. Um, this revised project, uh, the program eliminates the weight room and it is no longer an addition to a different structure, but will be standalone. Um, so it's also in a very different location, uh, different site, um, but it remains within the athletics and recreation district of campus in a proximal location with <clears throat> where the prior project was going to be located, um, associated with the uh, English field. So we're requesting final approval today, uh, but wanted to recognize that the associated demolition of a metal storage building um, that currently occupies the site will, um, will come before you uh, likely you know, in a couple of months this fall. Um, and then with me here today is Nick Duncan of Collie Architects, and I'm gonna turn it over to Nick to present the project to you. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for having us. Um, let me share my screen here. We'll start with the site, uh, the site and planting plan. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. let me jump back real quick here to the overall plan site. Uh, so the project is you know, located. Uh, Next to English Field, here here's a blow up of English Field. This is the Weaver Baseball Center, which was the previous uh, addition, and the uh, new project will be located in left field, uh, right beyond the the existing left field fence. 
in context, this is the existing uh, metal storage building that will be done demolished. demolished. Uh, it's approximately 1,500 square feet, and the new uh, uh, baseball pitching lab will be uh, a little over 2,000 square feet. Some context, this is from uh, just up the hill from, from the site, looking at Rector Fieldhouse, uh, a recent addition to Rector, and then uh, this is the Weaver, the, the site to the left of this picture with Weaver Beyond and, and then the English Field and Union Park. the uh, overall site and planning plan. We worked uh, closely with the university on, on developing this planting plan. Um, there's, you know, some, the plants are largely seen throughout the athletic facilities uh, in, in about the athletic facilities on campus. Um, very symmetrical kind of plantings on either side for uh, kind of near the symmetrics of the building. Stop me if you have any questions, comments, <laughs> planting listings, uh, floor plan. It's um, mostly open space for the two pitching lat, uh, lanes. So that, that's where they'll practice pitching and then some smaller support areas for those. The elevations. So in this one, we we work closely with uh, Lisa's team to develop this in a, in the hokey aesthetic. So a lot of uh, hokey stone and precast, uh, taking some nods to the collegiate Gothic architecture seen throughout campus, um, aluminum frame storefronts and, and glazing, uh, and then some, some aluminum uh, low up doors on, on the rear of the building. So this is a rendering of the front entrance. Um, again, just indicative of the, of the architecture throughout campus here. And then a rear rendering showing the, the ability to open it up to kind of an outdoor practice yard uh, and training yard there as well. So that's all we, uh, the slides I have to show. So if you have any questions you'd like to, or comments, I'd love to hear those. All right, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Papa and then we'll go across the room in that order and then with Ms. Jackson, myself. And, Tom, we're having a very hard time hearing you. Yes. Okay. I mean, I know that we have to use OP stone, and I like that for consistency. But this building reads to me at rest stop. Um, I think you might have overused it. Um, the back, right where you're looking at it right now, actually looks more appropriate to me and more consistent with. Baseball um, center than the other side. Um, why are we using so much Hokey Stone on such a small building? And the really big building behind it that is supposed to lay here actually has very little, and all of it is at the base. There's some compelling reason. And Ms. Morris, Mr. Duncan, did you hear the question? Um, a, uh, a little bit, I think. So the question I believe was uh, why use so much hokey stone on the front when Weaver was does not have that. Um, and, and I'll just kind of bring it back to the previous presentation we did where there was kind of the opposite comment that we received uh, where we didn't. Uh, we, we matched the, the Weaver and then uh, we're Kind of given some direction or to to make it less like the Weaver building, um, but uh, this was also, um, you know, a, a, a desire for the for the users 
to kind of create the, the look that uh, matched more of the canvas aesthetic overall, um, rather than some of the, maybe some of the recent additions and uh, that were put on to Weaver or um, some of the other rector and, and such that were mostly precast. Feels like there's a lot going on in the little building, and you can kind of reach the sort of rest stop on the highway for that. I don't know if uh, that's fair. I'm not trying to be unkind. I just think that if, uh, if you can read the little watermark, it's uh, in the that looks appropriate. Not a big project, not a big building, but cognitively the overall aesthetic of the campus. Uh, you know, I, I know you're probably being pushed in several different directions and hearing a lot of different input from other folks. So those are just my comments. But I appreciate that another building will be built at uh, Virginia Tech. And uh, thank you for the time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tom. Mr. Vaughn? I think so, yes. Okay. Great um, presentation. Uh, thank you for the clarification. But I was like, I saw the self project before, uh, but, it, but it sounds like it uses the functionality. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Vaughn, you're, you're breaking up a lot, I think. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, so the, I guess my comment was, thank you for the clarification uh, that this is a new standalone that's close to an addition uh, to the baseball uh, center. Um, I guess my big question is, I was hoping to see what it would actually look like in English field, like when you're on the, you know, in the stadium, do you see this, this structure or is it lower than the It's kind of hard to tell from that right now. So. Yeah. Um, if you would you would see kind of the, the top back side here. Uh, this is this is actually the left field fence, and it comes up about eight feet. So you will, from a very far distance, be able to see the, the kind of the top of this building. Yes, sir. Okay, and I guess to Tom's point, I don't know if it, if it makes more sense to have more of the sun on that side as opposed to the other side, because this is the side that I think more people will actually see. Um, yeah, it's you're right. It's a, probably a little difficult to understand from here, but it will. I mean, it there the, the spectators will only see it from pretty far distance. Uh, maybe if I go back to the site plan, that will be helpful. Yeah. So this is here, you know, the, the most direct views uh, would be from over this direction and or caddy corner from here across the field and over the fence. Um, they will have more of a view of it as they go up, obviously, but they're getting a little bit further away. So, you, I mean, nobody's within, yeah, a couple of hundred feet of the building. Uh, you know, there's a there's a fence here that kind of prevents anybody from going out beyond there. There will be people also viewing it from the track side, um, which would be over here. More limited spectators, of course. But. Can you go back to your uh, the site plan? Yes, sir. Is there a need for access? To the actual, like, is it going to function as a bullpen at all, or is it completely separate from that? Uh, not right now. My understanding uh, is that they they would have to create an equitable bullpen for visitors. Um, so if they wanted to do that during games, that my understanding is the rules would require an indoor bullpen for visitors as well. 
So that's probably not going to be the case for this unless the rules change. The bullpen now is um, lo located right here for the home team and the visitors is out here. Yeah, I don't have any uh, further questions or comments, but I do kind of agree with Tom in the sense that you could perhaps do some of the of the zone the front side or take a chance. How you articulate it a little bit. Okay. Um so I, I will be asking Mr. Vaughn and Mr. Papa to, to sort of make that into a concise recommendation when it comes to a motion. You know, using nouns and verbs and things like that. Okay, Joe, Ms. Wilson. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. I'd like to hear that perhaps you could still like the Griffin sign to... Uh, I think I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you, Ms. Wilson. I also agree with Ian and Tom that perhaps you could scale back the Griffin stone to the base and main entrance or entrances, um, just bring us a nice and detailed precast. It means at the top of the building. Um, I did have a question on what, um, it, it looks like some of the old windows are actually rolled up or actually the entrances do you go back to the site plan? And can you point out um, what openings are doors versus windows? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's the main entrance, obviously, and then these two here are roll up doors, kind of sectional roll up doors. Okay. And um, what is the purpose? I mean, what is the surface between the roll up doors? And and what will that space be used for? This is mo mostly, uh, it's going to be grass. It'll probably be a little bit, uh, maybe more maintained for them to do. They do some uh, like plyometric exercises and, and things like that. So it gives them just a little, when the weather's nice, the ability to kind of go out and use this space to do some of those exercises. They have stretching and uh, a lot of the things they do in the bullpen now they, they'll they'll kind of do here um, use utilizing this this wall to you know it might be whether it's you know throwing a medicine ball or or something uh, in in that kind of vein. Um, just depending on the amount of um, space that you you might consider a synthetic for, um, is there a need to connect that space to any outdoor adjacent walkway? Or is it just going to be used in and out of the- I'm sorry, what was the question? Is there a need to connect that outdoor exercise space to any of these surrounding walkways? Or is it just used from inside the building to the outside the building. Believe the intent. Okay. Um, so I didn't hear you, but Mike, I would just ask you to consider that now, and whether or not you should use the simple. That is that it's for any other, you know, it's strict area is, is what I'm trying to get at. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was saying that the space is to be an extension of the pitching area, so utilized uh, for the pitchers for their exercise purposes and, and not the team in general. Okay, those are all my comments. Thank you. 
be able to understand that. I How about apologize. now? Are we are we back? I think we had connection issues <laughs> on our <Yeah>. end. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. There we go. So we I think left off with Mr. Duncan at Green Space needed to be connected to any of the surrounding paths. Helen, did I paraphrase your question correctly? Uh, yeah, I uh, think he answered my I, question. I think Duncan answered my question. So my comments would just be about the extent of the stone and detailing the pre-cast and consideration of the term um, as synthetic term if it's, if it's anticipated to be heavily used. Okay. Thank you. Did you have other questions or comments, Ms. Wilson? No, that's all. Okay. Mr. Loth, do you have questions or comments? Um, thank you. I have to admit, I've never encountered a baseball pitch in that before, so I don't know what you're supposed to be. But I'm always in favor of having a physics as an exception. Uh, Can you hear me? Uh, Hello. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Nick or third or yeah. fourth word. Yeah, that's that's what we're doing as well. Okay. If you could read. State your question, Mr. Loth, uh, right, into the mic directly. Hear me clearly now. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. As I said, I have to admit that I've never encountered a baseball pitch in lab before, so I don't know what the appropriate aesthetic is one supposed to be. But I'm always in favor of you architecture. Particularly in the university complex, having a sense of place. And so I guess the way you should do it with this building is to introduce Hoagie Stone. Um, I have no objection to that, but um, building on the comments of my colleagues here, it probably can be arranged a bit more artfully. Uh, so I, I will leave it on to the use of Hoagie Stone here, but if there are adjustments to tailing, that's fine. And also, I have to add that the Department of Historic Resources has reviewed this project. It has no concerns about it. It does not involve any historic resources. Okay, thank you. Ms. Jackson on the line, do you have comments or questions for the applicant? Um, no questions. I am on. I think I, I didn't catch everything, so I don't want to repeat what I'm sure my colleagues have already said. But um, I, one question, is there is there a need for or it, will there be any signage on the building at all to identify the building? Let me go. Uh, well, I can show you. Right, here's going to be the, the campus standard uh, monument sign will be located here. And that's visible in the, uh, both this east elevation on the right side and then uh, right there. Um, Okay, okay. It's small, admittedly, in the rendering. <laughs> right, that's okay. I was just wondering, I didn't see it. Um, 
And I, not knowing what, I'm like Mr. Loach, not knowing exactly what the building should look like. I'm, I'm impressed because you, you wouldn't think a building like this would have that aesthetic look. So I, I um, if you think about what happens inside, I would never think walking up that this is what, it's a pitching lab. So um, for me, that's a positive for me. And I like that aesthetically. So with everything else that's been said, I didn't catch it all, but um, that's the only comment I have. I, I like that you really did. The building is a contrast to what you think may be happening on the inside. So I, I thank you and I, I'm fine. I have no other comments or, or questions. Thank, thank you. So at this time, this would be a motion for a final approval. And if there is one, could you please also elaborate on any recommendations coming from the board? Well, I would like to make a motion for final approval subject to the university revisiting the amount of coastal stone to be seen above the waterline of the building. That's the, that the university use the Weaver Baseball Center as a reference for Use the stuff so that the building is really Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. If not, then I call Mr. Papa. Mr. Vaughn. Aye. Ms. Wilson. Aye. Mr. Loth. Aye. Ms. Jackson. Aye. And cheers and I. Okay. Thank you. Uh Les, did you did you catch the the motion with the recommendation? I'm sorry, Liza, did you catch the motion with the recommendation? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And next is 3.2, Department of Juvenile Justice, New Juvenile Correctional Center in Bonaire. The project consists of eight separate buildings. Building one includes administration, staff training, security, administration, visitation, and intake. Building two includes health services, food services, laundry, warehouse, maintenance, and facility support. Building three includes education, career, and college readiness and recreation. And buildings four through eight are each housing units with bedrooms for 12 juveniles in each unit. And is the applicant on the call or in the room? Um, that will be in person, um, and just, okay. I guess I will need to just share the presentation from here, and okay. then you can just let me know how I need to advance through it. So, um, Bert, if you don't mind, just bear with me one moment while I pull up the presentation for the presenter. Sure. I can I can I can hear you just barely. I can make out the words. That's a little better. Thank you. Is this better, Mr. Chair? 
That's much better. Thank you. Okay. So good morning. My name is Tony Bell. I'm the new architect. We're here to present the Bon Air Correctional Center facility. We do have with me is Ms. Marianne Petrie, Department of General Services, and Mr. Michael Gibson, the project manager for the project of the New York As you may recall, we have presented this project to you before, back on March 1st of 2019. However, at that time, it was at a different site. In our White County. Okay. I won't go into the specifics, but the site has changed um, the direction of the owner. And we are now looking at the site in Chesterfield County at the existing Bon Air Correctional Center. So I will run through the project today. It will look very, very similar to the project that we presented to you back in March 2019, which was approved. Uh, we moved forward with the design process and we were authorized then to come back. During the preliminary design and make the subsequent presentation to you. So, uh, as uh, the chair said, the facility is composed of eight buildings. There are three, what I'll call unique buildings an academic building, a career and college readiness, an administration building, which mainly acts as intake and security purposes and offices for the staff, and then a health and dining building. Serves as a host for any of the residents who live on the campus. And then there are five housing units, each to house 12 residents on the campus and are arranged around. Mr. Lowe uh, stated a little bit earlier that the overarching desire of the project is to develop a sense of place, um, a sense of place that maybe doesn't exist as well as it could be uh, on the Bonaire campus. It's also to develop a rehabilitation environment. Many of these youth have uh, seen trauma in their lives for one reason or another. And as a result, the entire complex is based on common form design. Uh, that is to help these youth rehabilitate and get them back on their feet in order to make good decisions moving forward and become contributing members of our society. So with the existing Campus aerial photograph is on the screen. North is up on this image. Uh, Old Valley Road is on the left hand side, that is the west. And the new development will be basically fronting Old Valley Road. Can we go to the next slide, please. You can see here some of the vernacular architecture, existing site photography. Um, you see there the existing entrance coming from Old Valley Road. Upper right, that's the existing administration building, um, still in use. And the existing access road is on the bottom left with some security fence and some of the enclosed existing green space on the bottom right, as you can see. And then the view from the existing administration building back to Old Bonaire Road is the image that you see in the upper left. Next slide, please. These are the, the first five buildings that you encounter on the campus as you enter the campus from the west. So that existing administration building that you see there on the upper left, the rear of that building that's on the bottom left, that's basically the maintenance and uh, utilities function. The existing dining facility, which is no longer used as the dining facility for the correctional center, is on the upper right. And there are three Formal cottages, all which have been vacated, which form a semicircular pattern uh, south and west of the existing uh, admin building, dining building. All five of these buildings are proposed to be demolished as a result of, of this project moving forward. Uh, for a little bit of history, the three housing cottages were all built in 1970 for approximately 5,000 square feet. The dining facility and the admin facility were constructed in 1968, and there are approximately 9,000 square feet. When I spoke about the, the campus and the sense of place, there is a myriad of different architectural styles, um, crafts on this campus. 
sustaining a, a long period of time. Um, you see some of that represented here, some of the other structures, and some of them date back pretty far in our common law's history. Uh, we won't go through all of those today, but you get a little bit of a sense of, of different uh, collection of buildings. site plan of the existing campus. Uh, north is the upper right. Old Bonaire Road is horizontally across the top of the screen. And that academy building fronts Old Bonaire Road. So as you look at the campus from Old Bonaire Road, the only building you can see from Old Bonaire Road is that administration plan. Uh, there is a pretty good screen, uh, tree buffer between Old Bonaire Road and Campus, no residents can be seen, no razor ribbons can be seen, no security fences can be seen all along the road. And we would propose that, that basically remain intact throughout the development of this new campus. Now, I have not stated, but I will say now these two campus buildings will act independently from one another. So this is not seen as an addition to the existing on air correctional center, this is seen as a separate and distinct campus. Which will act independently from that existing campus. So the capacity of this new campus will be 60 residents. Next slide, please. What the slide indicates are the buildings that will be demolished and impacted by the new campus. Um, and a little bit of uh, tree cover, which will be compromised there on the uh, southwest side of the building. So this building puts a cross hatch for the building system to keep us shining. Excuse me, the admin on the top, the dining room immediately behind us, and then the three housing cottages sort of on the side of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. This is the proposed layout for the new campus. So you have five housing cottages in blue. And then you have the admin building in purple. That will be fronting the old line air road. So that will be the building you see if you look through the tree buffer the whole line air. The health and dining building will sit immediately to its south on the slide that is on the left. And then the career and college readiness building, as well as recreation building, will sit to the east of the admin building that is in the pink building. In the middle of the campus, again, is, is the development of the center place that we felt is somewhat lacking on the existing campus. So the goal is to develop basically a mini community college. Um, these, these are used for preparing for the world. Um, they're here because they are a, a, a bad decision or two, or the trauma that impacted their lives. So we're hoping that this environment will help them to get on the right path, help them move forward with their lives. So the um, campus will be uh, arranged around the lawn, and that lawn is with a recreational facility for the soccer field, basketball courts, tennis courts. This slide shows some of the proposed landscaping. Uh, obviously, there are septic concerns on this campus. It is a correctional facility. They need to create good lines of sight from building to building. Um, a lot of what I'll call waste high shrubbery or waste high trees uh, between the buildings. Uh, everything will be relatively low in terms of ground cover for trees which have been ripped up. Um, the trees which will be there will be like uh, grape girls, uh, red maples, things like that within the campus, within the, the quad. Uh, other types of trees that will be outside of the campus along, running along Old Bon Air Road. As you see, three different designations there that's lawn, planting beds, meadows, meadows.
Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So these are the proposed plant pallets that you will be seeing on the front line of the parking lot. I need to be outside of what we call the perimeter fence. And you can see here a broad spectrum of different uh, tree, tree types, many of them native, uh, with all of them native to Virginia. So we're not just against exotic or, or high maintenance. Um, but you can complement the existing campus. This is the meadow, the stream, and the stormwater DMP. These will be the vegetation surrounding those areas. Outside of the perimeter. Next slide, please. Mr. Chair, is everything coming in loud and clear for you, visually as well as audio, audio wise? Uh, yeah, yes, it is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, these are the security fence mounts. So, again, it is the goal and objective of DJJ, the Department of Justice, our client. But this is not razor ribbon and chain link fencing. Okay? Now, this is again a correctional facility. It needs to be a secure facility. So we need no punch in the wire, no razor ribbon on this weekend. We've designed some of the existing fencing that is, that is currently on the campus. Um, but this, these will be no climb options. Uh, when we talked earlier, we talked about the March of 2019, we talked about perhaps doing some vinyl coated fence, fencing that would disappear. The goal is also that no fencing would be visible, um, tree buffer or otherwise, on Old Bond Air Road. So those two buildings that front Old Bond Air Road, that's the admin building and the health and dining building, they basically screen the entire campus on Old Bond Air Road, okay? None of the housing units, none of the, uh, the common areas, that is the area that is controlled between the buildings the whole line of road because of those two buildings would be in the back. Um, any frontage on there would be full walls or vegetated walls uh, of those two buildings. Going to the next slide, please. And Mr. Bell, there's um, approximately two minutes left in your presentation okay. time. We'll step it up here. <laughs> you don't need to go to these fence now. Go ahead. I want to just look at different views of the so obviously this is from the southwest. Go ahead. From the west, Old Bond Air Road, the existing campus there in the background. This is from the north. This is from the left. Okay. From the south. Materials on the proposed buildings will all predominantly be masonry, uh, removed from the storefront, whether it's secure or unsecure. Um, there's some cementitious plaster and some cementitious uh, siding material, but very limited in scope and scale. Go ahead. Establish a sense of security, a sense of place in this different facility that we strongly call you. The white and the red that you see here indicated those are composed of different materials. Uh, you see the, the blue is the glazing material. Go on to the next slide, please. Goals to get a lot of natural daylight into these facilities. Again, that is very high. We need to do some, something that is lacking in this position. This is proposed out of the facility. There's basically three different brick types. There is not any modern CMU block proposed, whether it be 
ground based, food based, or otherwise at this time, um, with the exception of maybe some screen. <laughs> Thank, thank you, sir. We, 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 um, just want to start again with Mr. Poppin and work across the room. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Vaughn. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I do remember the project from last time in March 2017. I really appreciate the design and effort and kind of response and research and so on. Still based on the same analysis. And I think in some ways the way you uh, My only kind of comment moving forward is that it may or may not be able to do this, but some of the operating procedures are just and a lot of the work is probably have some dynamic with uh, the institution. How do you get response to that? But I understand, I guess that is a direction of concern in that one point of view. Something to consider. And I'm sorry, Ian, your comments are trailing off for us online. Right. If I could repeat, Mr. Whitehead confirmed that I captured the thoughts. Um, he said his comments uh, generally positive, uh, good development from the last time he saw the uh, presentation. Um, good thought in that the admissibility is screening the campus as a whole from Old Monterey Road. Um, if there was one critique you could make, it is the uniformity of the vision. Of the uh, sidewalk layout. The name of the buildings um, are not uh, boxes, if you will. Um, and therefore, what they need the sidewalks to reflect that same sort of aesthetic in terms of their layout. And maybe have some variance, not just if you will, all the way back on the name. Is that fair, Mr. Warren? Yep. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Ms. Wilson. Um, yeah, I would. I, I appreciate the team's um, effort to make a create a campus centered around a green space and um, sort of approachable architecture with the materials and things. Um, I also have the same comment as Ian um, about the. Um, Sort of, sort of rigidity, uh, the very formal layout of the walkways, in particular the lawn space um, above between the uh, admin building and dining and the athletic courts. That that 
landscape could be treated a little more informally. Um, and I would encourage you to think about, I, I know you've got issues with security, but uh, additional trees, got clumps of trees that would provide some shade areas for the residents. Um, and you might think about how people might crisscross that space from one destination point to the other and have the bots respond. Um, I, on the building elevations, I thought were in large part very well done and rational. Um, there were a couple areas uh, on the buildings where there were sort of vertical stripes of different materials that I didn't understand what they responded to. Um, whereas other parts of the building were, you know, were very well composed. So I guess my comment on that would just be to consider how the vertical stripes of different materials, what they relate to, can they be more um, thought out, like for the rest of the building elevations. Um, and then uh, my final comment would be about the meadow, which I couldn't tell the extent of exactly on the plans, but um, meadows are pretty tricky to establish and maintain. They're beautiful when they work well. Um, but I just um, want to make sure that the agency understands how to get them established and how to maintain them because it's, it's not um, low maintenance. Especially when trying to keep out invasive plants. Thank you. It's a nice project. Thank you, Helen. Mr. Lewis. Oh, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting project. To what extent does this exclude uh, that one particular as a facility or those are very bad? When you say abandoned, there was never anything constructed. Okay, the way. Uh, okay. Uh, now you heard about the time of the high school. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I will say that the demolitions will have to be submitted both to this and to the department. So, if you have Because my note gives us that the issue is not formal with the review this is an issue. I'm not sure exactly what the work is for, but it should be submitted. But and and particularly with the evolution. I don't believe it's the same for archaeological research that might be on the site. Yeah. Yeah. As well as um, is this for final approval or is it for this is for preliminary approval? Okay, because we did go through some of the elevations of the building from quickly. It's we did go nice. I don't see them recording their question of their decision. So assuming we go or detailed presentation. I know that they just want the architecture. I think detail of the landscape is the key. But uh, uh, more detail on the plan. Final plan. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 I didn't even anticipate this was a bad thing. Okay. Um, Google. Google. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If I could ask a question, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this project is a little bit different in that we're not just going with the scale of the original two different one building on campus. We're creating the campus. Mm -hmm. So we have eight different buildings, really only four different unique buildings. So I'm wondering when we come back. Like this presents to talk about four different buildings. How have you seen that best done? Um, what we have at the time is going to go into a little detail on 
each of those buildings you just presented? Well, I'll just start with it. Oh. Has it uh, and the time constraints. Very good. So I, I, I didn't hear that the comment, but I would think, Tony, that we would have focused certainly on the layout of the master plan with the illustrative site plan components, uh, understanding relationship and orientation and those types of things. I think your approach to this campus looks pretty consistent. So I'm not sure every building will need to be reviewed for every detail just understanding sort of the general disposition of the architecture. Um, if there are complexities within it, maybe you wanna delve into that. And if, if, if your final presentation, once you submit it, looks like it may require more than 15 minutes, we can certainly work through that. But, but I think um, you, you've shown that you can do it. So I think you can do it. Mr. Chair, my I just suggest that uh, maybe if we ask in advance to get the future response or give them more time in advance and make one of those projects. Sure. Whatever that is. Just a suggestion. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Lowe, do, do, were you? Finished with your questions and comments. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Okay. Miss Jackson. Okay. I'm sorry. I was trying to unmute. Um, I have no additional um, no additional questions, and um, I just want to say I, I see that where you it was challenged to strike that balance between its intended purpose and use of the building. But you managed to do that by creating that campus feel. So um, I think that has been accomplished. And I thank you for really presenting a detailed presentation, which I guess warranted other questions as well, but it was well presented. So that's that's the only comment that I have. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Angela, I have one question. If you could go back to the slide that says aerial view from south. Um, I don't know, somewhere mid presentation um, and time while she's doing it, I think my question is there, there seem to be courtyards for the residential buildings. Yeah, that slide right there will work. Um, and is that, are these activity spaces? Can you elaborate a little bit on, on what, what I'm looking at with the uh, courtyards there? They are, they are individual mm -hmm. backyards for the individual Okay, thank you. And I think you, well, you answered my question. So they're not intended to be separately secured. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, I didn't have it. I'm sorry. I have one further comment. 
Chief, what sure. I see, what I see here are back then three repeated designs and two repeated designs. So I guess we come back there. I mean, you can look at two of the different designs of different figures, and the others are two figures. Is that correct? Did they differ that much? Well, the, the five house all work. Oh, they are. Okay, yeah. this is a little misleading. Why was it skinny? Uh, I guess this is. Okay, well, then we are there are four different building types. There's the housing, of which there were five, at the uh, nine, and then there are the So we only need to look at one design for the Yeah, okay. the uh, four different building types. So we cover that just in one part. Okay, so this is a motion for preliminary approval. And if there is one, please go ahead. This is Tom. I'll move preliminary approval. Thank you, Tom. Second. It's Mr. Vaughn. Okay. So uh, calling the question now, Mr. Papa. Mr. Vaughn, Ms. Wilson, Hi. Mr. Loth. I Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Hi. And the chairs and I. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And the last case is 3.3, Department of General Services and Capital Square Preservation Council's Capital Square Exterior Signage Package. We have, um, Bert, that's um, going to be a virtual presentation. So I'm promoting okay. the panelists for that one now. Okay. Good afternoon, Amy. Can you hear us okay? There we go. All right. There we go. Did I, did I need to promote anyone else with you or is it just you? Um, I think Craig um, is going to say a few words. Okay. Give me just a moment uh, and I'll go I, ahead and add him. Yeah, he's not going to present. Um, I will present. Okay. So I'll make him a panelist just so he's able to speak during your presentation. Excellent. Okay, so you all should be ready to go. You may go ahead and start. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of uh, the board. I'd like to uh, also recognize our collaborators, Department of General Services on this presentation. Uh, I just want to take a few moments uh, to reiterate Capitol Square Preservation Council's uh, understanding that this is a this interpretive sign program is uh, definitely a work in progress. We do understand that there are many areas of this project which uh, need to be answered, and so we are coming today before the Art and Architecture Review Board to um, have a preliminary review of this schematic package, uh, knowing that we will return uh, for additional review and for a final approval in the future. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce uh, Amy Siegel, who is a, a partner and uh, at CNG Partners and uh, the contractual firm working with Capital Square Preservation Council on an exterior signage program for Capital Square. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to present this program, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Um, as Craig said, I'm a partner at CNG Partners, which is a, a, a multi-specialty design firm in New York City. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and start this. Let's see.
Okay. So um, I assume everyone can see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay, so um, just to just start with just the basic principles behind this program, um, you know, we are, are looking to create um, a trail of signs that makes sense from a, um, a directional perspective to mark key destinations in Capitol Square to um, deal with any kind of impediments such as accessibility issues and to, to add to the uh, distinctive visual identity of the, of the square. Um, we're, we're trying to make the signage more consistent with the use of language and placement and use color and symbols in a meaningful way. Um, we started by doing research and documenting all the signage that's currently on uh, Capitol Square, which um, shows um, that it was installed at a variety of times. There are a variety of typefaces and colors and styles that have accumulated over the years. Um, so the first page here is kind of like the directional and um, and rules and regulation signs. Um, the second page shows kind of the more interpretive and um, um, monument related signage. So, um, you know, we'll start by just talking about the various components of the signage and then we'll, we'll get into the, the actual design elements. Um, you know, we uh, were looking to create something that reflects the aesthetics of Richmond and, and of Capitol Square. We're very cognizant of the history and uh, trying to incorporate that into the sign program. Uh, we're also very cognizant of um, the views on Capitol Square and trying to make sure that uh, whatever signage we create is um, additive in, a, in an aesthetic way and doesn't block anything that um, visitors would wanna see uh, when, when looking around the square. So um, this is just a, a, an overview of the sign family in a very generic way and we'll get, we'll get into this in more detail. Um, so the first thing is the, the signage that goes around the uh, perimeter of the square. And basically the purpose of these signs is to um, um, really tell the visitor at each entrance um, kind of an overview of, of what's available in the square through a map um, to direct people who are either handicapped or have other accessibility issues, whether it be uh, pushing a, a, a stroller or pushing a, a wheelchair, where, um, where they can uh, um, comfortably enter the square and get around. And then um, also provide rules and regulations uh, of uh, codes of behavior uh, while on the square. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about this um, but there's there's a, a low one that's in front of the um, the fence around um, most of the entrances, and then two taller ones that flank the entrance. And uh, as I said, these would have um, hours, um, you know, of of the the squares open. They would have a map and um, some information about accessibility and directional information as well as uh, rules and regs. So starting with it just generically, this is the placement of the tall signs at the entrance and then um, these kind of lower uh, signs that would be placed in front of each of the entrances um, at the fence. Then once you get into the park, um, we've um, developed these four kind of medium sized signs that are um, at each of what we're calling the hubs of the park that would again um, have some mapping, some directional information and um, reiterate uh, codes of conduct. And then these smaller signs, which are really for um, just very necessary 
kind of directional information to get to uh, various points, either how to exit the park, how to um, get around in an accessible in, for an accessible path, and and so forth. And that just kind of gives you a sense of the height of these um, kind of low signs at the hubs, and then the smaller signs um, for direction around the site. Uh, lastly, we have uh, a set of interpretive signs that are also low that would um, uh, give more information about the various monuments um, on the site. And those would also be a, a low sign that, um, you know, would not block any, any views. And then in terms of just the, um, the location of information on the signs, we um, generally, at least on the, on the taller sign that's out um, at the entrances, directional information would be high on the sign um, so that it could be seen overhead. Um, and then more um, detailed information such as mapping and rules and regulations would be lower down where you would be more, um, come closer to it and be more intimate with it. So um, here is um, uh, where we are with the map. For, um, for Capitol Square. Uh, this would be something that you would see at each of the entrances that would help um, kind of give the visitor an overview of, the, uh, of what's available on Capitol Square. It very clearly marks um, the accessible entrances so that um, visitors won't be frustrated by entering somewhere where they, they can't um, get around. The, the stairs are, are um, visible on the map you know, where there are stairs so that uh, people can, can see right away um, what's not accessible. Um, the visitor entrance is very clearly marked um, so that um, when you're coming in from the other um, entrances, you can see where you're trying to get to, as well as um, all the monuments and points of interest. So, um, this, um, this package um, marks the end of our schematic design and we had shown various um, um, design possibilities and this was the one that was chosen. And um, it's basically, um, you know, really picks up on the, on the historic uh, fence elements. It's um, the, the posts of the signs are um, meant to um, reiterate the, the um, size and shape of the fence post and uh, the color. And then um, the rest of the coloration comes from the, um, the logo type that was developed for the square and, um, you know, sticks to the, the blues and the greens. So here you see the, the sign family, the tall kiosk, the low kiosk that um, is um, inside at the hubs, the smaller directional sign, the interpretive sign, and then the sign at the, uh, at the entrances. And this just gives a general idea of placement for the um, signs at the entrances. the sign at the various um, other entrances, the, the lower sign, and then the signs at the hub. And the small directional signs. And then lastly, the uh, interpretive. So that kind of covers the uh, the general um, program. Um, I don't know if you would like to open this up to questions now or if, uh, have any. Yep. Endings. Well, we'll we'll open it up to questions from the board members, starting with Mr. Papa. And thank you, Amy. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> undertaking this task. 
Um, and just uh, is your is is your mic on, Mister Mister Papa? It's, it's breaking. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Siegel, can you hear me? Can you not hear that? I can barely hear you. I'm not sure what else I can hear. Um, is that any better? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll let you know if there's if I missed any words, and maybe someone else can fill in. Some people really like you're missing what I said, so no, don't, don't go overboard. Don't worry. Um, I appreciate that you're undertaking to have some consistency because that seems to be something we're very lacking. Uh, so, with with that said, I like the idea of having a, a consistency of color, size, and type base. Um, it would be very nice if your system had something that separately uh, describe that color shape size separately identify where you are um, maybe what you are seeing all in one spot one one type and then something different that somebody could easily look at and say uh, you know, where where the directional sign is is or some sort of other type or directional sign so somebody can quickly and easily see that it looks like that's what you're, you're working towards and then maybe something that had a different color that uh, indicated aid location police and rules um, i would very much like to see um, now that we've gone through a pandemic and everybody's very used to using a qr I, I think it would be very helpful to ever decide uh, and where where it made sense had a QR, maybe a directional sort of um, hit it with your camera, you could then pull up on a map exactly where you are. Um, and lastly, what I'd like to throw out there is that uh, there's nothing worse than having a sign that is twisted or bent. And I think one of the things that we consistently do is we use the least expensive anchoring system and we use materials that are quick to bend, rust, twist. And I would highly encourage uh, given a, a set of materials that are a very sturdy or last for a long time. So I see what you're doing and I think it's very, it's very good. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, did, think, did you did you catch you caught all of that, most of that? Yeah, and um, I just want to say that um, you know we have um, considered um, those issues, and um, basically the way the system is developed is um, to have a very sturdy structure that's um, tough and durable um, via powder coated. Uh, metal, uh, probably a steel, and that the components of the um, of the signs are made. As you can see, the um, the the idea of blazing a trail, um, the the directional information is on the bright blue, so that it's very um, it works like a beacon that you can see. And then um, when you get to the uh, interpretive and the mapping, it kind of quiets down a little bit, but um, and then there's a, a separate panel for rules and regulations. And uh, one, of the, um, um, one of the ideas here is that um, the panels are all separate so that things can be changed over time without having to um, change the entire sign. Um, so we're, we're trying to build in permanency and flexibility at the same time which we have uh, found has been very successful in other park projects that we've done. I think it looks great. And I guess what I'm trying to say is when you look down the lower part of the one to my left, um, there's a lot of verbiage there. There's an awful lot of material. And what I would encourage you to do is consider making the headline a 
different color. Just so that somebody is looking for historical information, it's there. But they can see it at a glance and that's what they're looking at. And then below that can be a different color for the rules and regulations. And then maybe a different one, you know, a red one that says, hey, this is an emergency. This is what you did. You know, people that want to know when you flew. A, a lot of that signage, I think, will be lost on most people, probably people like, like I am. Um, you know, if I'm looking for something in particular, I would like to be able to get my ID in a hurry. And again, a QR code, having a place on the sign, and even if you don't put it in today, uh, and maybe QR codes that can come the past, but something will always, you know, in our future, I think we have to realize that there's a lot more information that we could access simply by hitting it with our camera. So, anyway, I, I think it's a very good. System that you started with, and uh, I, there are things that I would like to see that were just a little bit more uh, developed. But I, I, you know, what I see, I like very much. I, I very much appreciate that somebody is undertaking to have that kind of consistency in our system. So, thank you. Oh, the, thank you. After coating is only for an aluminum product. If you're going to use steel, I don't think. So I, I'm not sure that aluminum is, is really, um, unless you use a, a heavy gauge, I just worry about these things starting to look terrible. So I'm not telling you what to use or what to suggest us, but I would just encourage something that is well anchored and a sturdy material. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Um, yes, hear me? Yes. All right, good. Um, great presentation, uh, very clear. Um, you know, a good understanding of what you guys are trying to do. Uh, definitely clear. I did have a few questions uh, regarding like the boundaries, if you will. Um, and the map that you indicated, you identified several other buildings uh, around uh, area and i was curious is, is there an intent to also provide uh informational signs for those buildings that are on the surrounding uh, perimeter uh, is that uh, part of the scope or is that um well when you say um the signs um that are at the perimeter um let me just go back here um are you talking about um these these buildings which which buildings are you talking about? Oh, I think it's like like um, the, the, the building road. Right and then the building next door. Um, all the buildings that are like you've got white text. They're 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 in blue, but they're they're technically part of this, this area and they've got you know significance uh, to to the area. And I feel like it might it might be uh, advantageous to have signs for those. Uh, that would be sure if that was part of the scope or not. And you know you talk about consistency, and if there was any signs in the future, it's something to consider. So, for example, the historic uh, customs house or court of appeals or other buildings that are not on Capitol Square proper, is that what you're asking, Ian? Yeah, because they're they are identified on this on this map. So I just um, so okay. If it was if it was possible, I think it might be especially to talk about you know providing consistency. Well, currently our scope is just on Capitol Square, but there's nothing that says that it couldn't be expanded to um, um, incorporate some of those other areas in the future. Okay. Um, the other kind of question I had was you had different different scales of the sign and it appeared that the tallest one is what you have on Bank Street at the front. Right. The um, we have two taller ones um, at the entrances, and that's mainly. Um, I guess when we did our uh, study, we felt that there are a lot of places um, where you you really can't see the entrance, and so we're trying to make these two signs be um, a kind of beacon to let you know that you've arrived at at the entrance, since it is um, kind of hidden. 
And, okay, I, and I guess my, my opinion, I feel like that's just kind of the purpose of how that was kind of established in that corner at that entrance. So I think in some ways those signs, how they're located currently are kind of fake. Um, I think it might be worth considering uh, having signs on the gate like we've got everywhere else. Um, the other thought was, um, from a consistency standpoint, you could probably have you know, three types of signs instead of four if you were to use Tom's suggestion of a QR code and having more of that information digital. Less material to think of that. Anything else? Um, I think that I think that's it overall. I think it, I think it's good. Um, I'm curious to see what they come back with, and I think uh, also it's important to consider how these um, these signs will be anchored. Uh, so we'd like to see that um, moving forward. Oh, thanks. Thank you, um, Helen. Uh, yeah, um, I also appreciate um, you're taking on this pretty complex uh, science task and the work that you've done thus far to analyze the existing um, signage and then you know, develop a palette of signs that um, take on different meaning. Um, I, I do feel like I'm worried that there are too many signs. Uh, we didn't see a map with all of them overlaid, the interpreter plus the, all the other interior wave lining plus the entry points. And I think if we did, um, well, even with the maps that we saw, I become concerned that there are too many. And um, I think my colleagues have mentioned some ways that that could be reduced. Um, I'll just run out lists of thoughts that I have, but um, for example, where you have the, the primary entrance sign, such as here at the Capitol Visitor entrance, and then the vehicular um, entrance, do you need two flanking or would one suffice? Um, and also, where you have a secondary entrance sign, if there's one an entrance very nearby that is within visual, you know, within your vision, do you, you know, need one at each of those entrances? Um, the interior wavelining signs that you know are absolutely all of those needed, and is there an opportunity for an electronic uh, way to? convey some of this information and simplify it. Obviously, as we've heard others say, QR is the current um, technology for that that could change. Uh, but I think there's a way to design the signs with that kind of flexibility. But you know, if you take on the signage, um, there is um, a maintenance aspect of it and upkeep uh, if things change or get damaged or in some being damaged by the sun. So I think investing in signage is really important here and very, very important, but I would just be strategic uh, about exactly how many um, are needed. They can always be added later if it's felt, but I would just go with um, you know, a, a reasonable number. I'm just again concerned about proliferation of signage and can any of these be um, combined? Uh, there are a lot of interpretive signs, one for each monument. I don't know if there's an opportunity to combine any. And uh, are there any monuments? I'm not familiar with all of them, but any monuments there that are in question as far as um, will they remain in Capitol Square or are they like other monuments in Richmond? Potentially not leaving this landscape. So I don't know the answer to that, but um, those are all my, my comments. I'm mainly concerned about the number of science leaders in this very significant historic landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Calder? Uh, thank you. I think this is a really important project and it's a 
And I recognize that this is a work in progress and it will probably be a time to consider. I will say, and I'm, I'm can can you move the mic closer to you? Okay. All right. Is is this better or too loud? Yes, sir. No, that's better. All right. I I will say that it's probably recognize that this is a work in progress and that um, it probably will be a little bit decided about it. Uh, DHR uh, has informed me that it has not reviewed this project and will need to be consulted before finalization. Of these plans. And it also said given previous project reviews regarding new installations, um, they, DHR has expressed concern that they could have a cumulative and negative impact on the landscape of Capitol Square. Um, and um, uh, I agree with DHR that it's concerned that design proposed for the back street entrance could negatively impact the difficult historic views towards the capital and towards Bank Street, as well as the sign close to the edge of the town and all the streets. Those are just some examples where I think we need to give a lot more thought about the placement of the signs and, and actually the effect of the design. And I will be glad to work with the DHR and the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jackson. Uh, thank you. Uh, I see it as someone who's a visual artist, I know it's quite a challenge to try to balance it. But I think you really did an excellent job with accomplishing that, especially with the signs being able to to move and change as, as information changes. And I know it's challenging, I'll probably go back, I'm sure, and look at the verbiage, but I think to have that hierarchy in the signs that you have presented was really a smart choice to make. And the color choices, I really, I really like the color choices as well. And, it, and everything you said is what I was going to ask. It really does stick out and I can see the difference between the purpose of each sign there. And I, I I think when you look at the one that's for interpretive information, sometimes I, I thought about the QR code as well. And I know it's more expensive to have um, it interactive digital, but I think when individuals do step up to a sign, they may want to read. And my experience working with, you know, with the Smithsonian and, and signage at that point, we always had that challenge as well. But in the long run, the end people do stop and read the information. So I, I like, the layout and I'm sure you'll go back and look at the number of signs and also what language would go in each sign. So overall, I, it's really, it's really um, aesthetically pleasing. I, I like the color palette and everything and, and the height and the, the overall layout of the signs. And that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. A um, couple of questions for me and this might be a question for Mr. Reynolds, and I think uh, Helen and Tom alluded to, is there intended to be a digital component or some kind of virtual companion to this wayfinding program sometime in the, in the future, if not now? Mr. Chairman, I can answer uh, that question. Our intent is to have actually a dual um, uh, uh, format here for the delivery of, of particularly content, educational content. We haven't yet determined exactly how we're going to make the virtual platform connect with the physical platform in the form of signage on Capitol Square, but that that is a goal. Um, I'll also share with you that CNG Partners um, is contracted with, with council uh, to develop a standalone website for Capitol Square. That design work is also ongoing parallel to this signage program. And uh, we're just not far enough along in that process to have the exact answer. Is it going to be a QR co code? Is it going to be some sort of you know, software that will know where your location is on Capitol Square? We're not, not quite far enough along in either project to know exactly 
how they will dovetail together, but I assure you it is an overall goal of uh, this project, which is part of an overarching Capitol Square visitor experience mandate that that council is working on to try to improve the visitor experience. And, and I might just as a concluding comment here, the significance for us in terms of the signage and the digital platform is that the vast majority of our visitors to Capitol Square are first time visitors and non repeat visitors. So the folks coming, they're unfamiliar with us. It's a difficult place to get to. And then once they're there, um, sorting out where to go, the number of times that, that visitors will go up to the portico of the Capitol and physically try to open the doors, not understanding that the entrance is down on Bank Street. So there's a lot here that has to be sorted out and a lot of information that has to be delivered while also trying to keep the, 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 the footprint, the impact on Capitol Square li as limited as, as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and in my sort of beggar, yes. Mr. Chairman, I just make a comment. It, it might be nice, if, even if you don't have a website, if you have a consistent location on signs where there will be some sort of either QR or whatever the feature holds, but where people just simply know that's where they look. And even if you have a QR code that simply sends them to Wikipedia or Google Maps or something, there's no really a good reason why we can't have something on this initial set of signs that help people figure out where they are, what they're looking at, and help them figure out where they want to go. So while you're developing that website, I would encourage that we use right up front some sort of a system that uh, gives us a link to you know, all of that sort of great stuff. And thank you. And it sounds like that, that's certainly the, uh, one of the directions they're going. And I would just say maybe if when you come back with this for a final, if there's just a bullet point at the top of the presentation, just letting us know where you are in those parallel efforts, that, that would be very helpful and appreciated. And Tom, I would say I'd be careful linking to anything that we don't control, because once that link goes away, it is very frustrating to get page not found whether it's Wikipedia or Google or anything from, from somebody's link. Um, been there, done that, hated it. Um, on the other question, I think this might be for uh, Amy more directly. So what is the current thinking in terms of providing accessible signage for the visually impaired? Um, I don't know that um, that's ever been discussed as part of this program. Um, you know, this, you know, the the ADA, you know, ac accessibility um, portion of the program. But um, yeah, there's no like sound, um, you know, like I know in New York we have you know talking, crossing walks, and things like that, but we've never discussed having any um, electronic components in these signs. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I would maybe just if there's a way to think about that, um, whether it's a, a future add-on, whether it's it's it whatever that might be. Um, I don't know what all the current technology is, but um, it's one of those things we certainly don't want to not over, we don't want to overlook given sort of the significance of Capitol Square. Um, okay, I think those are my only questions and comments. So this is for a preliminary approval um, and we'll see again a final as it moves forward. Is there a motion? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, this is Helen. Um, I just, I wanted to follow up on um, Ian's really good comment about uh, whoever is responsible for this, but to consider um, the significant buildings around Capitol Square as well as the uh, General Assembly and Olson Hall. Uh, just 
or there may be buildings to the south that I'm not aware of, but um, certainly there are important facilities that feel like they're on the same campus. Um, that could be I'm sorry, Amy, can you back up to your entrance signage map uh, locations? Great, thank you. So we we're talking about Patrick Henry, Old City Hall, General Assembly Building, Morton's Row, Morrison's Row, Court of Appeals beyond Cal Square. Is that, is that, I mean, am I capturing what you're saying? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. I realize it's not uh, the scope okay. of the project, but I think it is a good point that you raised. Yep. Uh, okay. So, well, uh, is there then a, a motion with the comments? And don't worry, we'll make sure and capture these in the notes as well uh, for preliminary approval. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion for preliminary approval rather than recycle everything that was uh, previously said. I think since they're going to come back with a personal, uh, perhaps uh, motion on the simply to uh, move for approval of preliminary, uh, preliminary approval with the, with the caption. That they take into consideration all of our comments. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Calling the roll, Mr. Papa. Aye. Mr. Vaughn. Aye. Ms. Wilson. Aye. Mr. Loth. Aye. On the condition that this is presented to the HR for consultation. Uh, thank you. And again, to this applicant and all the applicants, I recognize the audio challenges that we've had in this meeting and we'll make sure that the notes are very clear as to what the motions and recommendations and responses are. Okay, and Ms. Jackson on this motion? Aye. And the chair is an aye. Okay, thank you very much. Look forward to seeing this going forward. Thank you. All right. Uh, and I think that brings us to the end of our agenda. And if there is no further business, then we are adjourned. Our next meeting is, help me, Angela. I have. I, I can't pull it up at the moment. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> no, no worries. Let me see if I can. I think it's October 1, I believe. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Next meeting is October 1, October 1st. Thank you, Rich. And so I'll see. Um, yes. Just, just to let you know, I will not, we'll do it then either in person or virtually in October 1. And then November 1, I can do it for virtual, but not in person. Okay, so, thank you. And, uh, and I think I would. Uh, I just sort of need to triage the sort of the audio quality with with DGS uh, on maybe how we can maybe try and get it a little better. It is, is presents a little bit of a challenge. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Okay.